course, in Jonah's case, we've seen mostly disobedience, but we've seen the blessing of obedience and the uh, judgment for disobedience, and we've seen this kind of in Jonah's life. And we're going to pick up in chapter 4, and I think we're going to start in, let's see, where are we going to start? Verse 3? Verse 4. Verse 4. Four. Uh, we, added, we did three verses last week, so we're going to pick up in verse number 4, and we're going to finish the book tonight. Yay! All right, so... Uh, so tonight we're going to conclude the strange conclusion, and we're looking at we're going to look at the topic of a painful prison, and uh, we're going to see in Jonah's life what he does to himself as this story wraps up. Uh, somebody asked me before the service, you, you know, you got you you have these eleven verses and it just kind of ends. What happens to Jonah? Yeah. <laughs> and I said. Like, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We're not told. But uh, we know what happens to the end of this story of Jonah here. And uh, that's what we want to look at tonight. So if you've got a Bible, find Jonah 4. If you don't, and you can follow along on the screen with us, that's fine as well. We'll have the scripture up there for us. Stay with me if you would, out of respect for the reading of God's word. And if I'm covering, you know, seven or eight verses, we might be here all night. You know, if we're used to, we're used to those one or two verses. So look, look at verse number four. And again, getting into verse number four, if you remember the first three verses last week, uh, Jonah was upset at God for saving Nineveh. And uh, verse number three, he said, My life's worth nothing. Just go ahead and kill me. I don't deserve to live. And we talked about how foolish that was to say. That picks up in, the, in verse number four here. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die. And here we go again, said... It was better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. And dude's arguing with God. Can you, can you picture this? Verse 10 and 11. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your love and your goodness. Thank you for the testimony time we've had. Uh, Lord, it's been good just to praise you and to uh, thank you for when you work in our lives and when you answer prayer. We're thankful for uh, the many times that you do that. We're thankful for your many blessings. And uh, it's been good to sing and just to be with your people and uh, hear a good missionary report as well. And we just ask you now as we finish up the book of Jonah, Lord, we pray that you'll use this last lesson to once again just challenge us in our relationship with you, challenge us in, in our uh, testimony for you before others as well, Lord, through this we pray. Uh, we just ask you now to bless this time of preaching and teaching and again use it in our lives to strengthen and encourage us, we pray. We ask these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. No doubt you've heard the expression, you made your bed, now you got to lie in it, right? Now you got to sleep in it, whatever. This is basically the dilemma Jonah has put himself in at the end of this book. Everything around Jonah has changed, but Jonah's stinking, sinful, selfish, disobedient heart has not changed. You notice this? And God has done great things, tremendous things around him. And, and an entire city comes to Christ and experiences this great revival. And there's Jonah still sulking because he didn't get his way. He is probably more miserable now than he even was in the belly of the whale. Uh, he didn't pray in the belly of the whale to go ahead and kill me, Lord. He said, get me out. Now he's praying, just kill me. I'm not, I don't even, I don't even, not even living. Um, I'm afraid there's a lot of people today, a lot of Christians today too, not just, not just the world, but I think there's a lot of Christians today as well that are living their Christian lives in a prison without bars. They put themselves into a situation 
and, and they're not allowing God to bring them out of that particular yeah. situation. Wow. Uh, their, their attitude is, is soured. Uh, their heart is, 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 is a stain. They're just, you know, oh, I'm going to, uh, and, and, and you're like, come on, you know, you can shake this. Oh, no, no, I can't, you can't do it. And, and so sometimes we put ourselves in that position. That's what Jonah has done. There's really no reason that in this chapter that Jonah shouldn't be shouting from the housetops what, what God has done. He should be jumping for joy, traveling around, telling everybody what God did in Nineveh. But where is he? Oh, just kill me, God. I don't deserve to live. Uh, what, a, what a sad, pathetic position we find him in. This pouting prophet in a pathetic position. And he, now he's ending this book in a, in, a, in a painful prison that he's put himself in. And so as we think about that tonight, let's go through our outline, and we'll look at a couple thoughts here tonight. The first thing I thought about this as we conclude uh, Jonah here in this account of Nineveh, I see a contentious intolerance. A contentious intolerance. Uh, tolerance is one of those key uh, buzzwords that's used today in our society, isn't it? Uh, you got to be tolerant, you got to be tolerant. Jonah's intolerant completely to the people of Nineveh. Uh, he, he wished, again, that God would have just killed them all rather than them see revival. Uh, and, and so we see this in his life. He, he, Jonah is asked, <coughs> excuse me, Jonah is asked a couple times by the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? <laughs> doest thou well to be angry? Jonah, <laughs> the dude, he's so messed up at this point in his life. The, the one time he answers God, he says, I, I do well to be angry. <laughs> even unto death. <laughs> Excuse me. Even unto death, I, I, I deserve this, God. I, I, it's right for me to be angry here. Uh, we're going to see that in this contentious intolerance, it's all about Jonah's attitude. It's all about his attitude. i got to get this out. Hold on a second. <coughs> Excuse me. No, I'm good. I just had a little uh, little spit come in there and get, get trapped in the wrong place. So. <coughs> the spit section didn't want it. I had to take it back. So, <laughs> Sorry, that's gross. <laughs> but we're going to see that this intolerance had everything to do with his attitude. And again, I know, I know we're, you know, we're mostly you know, uh, grown adults in here. We have, we have a couple that are still working on it, Noah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. But we understand, I think, I hope... Even at our age, you know, we tell our kids this, we tell teenagers this, but we, we have to understand how important the attitude is in life, right. especially in the Christian life. Attitude is so extremely important because I can, I can deal with a lot of things if my attitude is correct. I can push through a lot of problems when my attitude is correct. Jonah's attitude is so messed up, that's what causes this intolerance. Look, look, at, uh, look at Jonah's attitude as we see this intolerance. The first thing you see is, a, is an incorrigible attitude. An incorrigible attitude. Jonah has no desire to see the, the town and the people of Nineveh come to Christ. He has no desire to see God's judgment spared upon them. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Throughout Jonah's life, throughout Scripture, throughout our lives, and throughout the end of time, God has always been merciful and gracious Slow to anger, slow to wrath, plenteous in mercy. But Jonah is, all of a sudden, you find Jonah still, he's, he's sullen and he's disgusted in his spirit. His attitude stinks. Uh, he does not want what happened to happen. He's still sitting outside the town waiting for God to bring judgment to the town. Proverbs 20, verse 27 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. I thought, what does that mean? And it finishes the verse that says this, Searching all the inward parts of the belly. Searching all the inward parts of the belly. Our attitude in here is shown most of the time out here. Right? And, and when it's out here, it's usually because something's going on in here. And, and the attitude is extremely important. We see that in Proverbs. Uh, somebody said this, attitude determines altitude. Uh, you're not going to go far in life with a stinky, rotten attitude. An employer's not going to promote you with a stinky, rotten attitude. Uh, you know, your marriage, your child, your whatever, whatever th blank you want to fill in, it's not going to go real far in life with a dirty, stinky, rotten, nasty uh, attitude. I'm not, I'm not. Well, this is Jonah. This is Jonah. Jonah is of no value right now to the work of God because of his attitude. He can't be used. Uh, he's not even praising God. He, he's not telling people about what God had just done. He's just sitting there sulking. Uh, the most dangerous thing about this bad attitude or this evil, you can call it an evil spirit if you want to, because that's really what it is. Here's the worst thing about a bad attitude. It's contagious. It's contagious. Uh, when one person is mad and disgruntled and has a bad attitude, 
it very quickly spreads to the person that's around them and near them, uh, and, 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 and problems start to arise when one bad attitude spreads to somebody else. Have you seen it? Yeah. Happens at work. Happens at churches. Uh, somebody gets disgruntled, spreads the bad attitude, and all of a sudden there's an insurrection, and oh, you know. What, what happened? Attitude. Attitude. Uh, I think God here is, is really trying to console Jonah. Remember when he brings his gourd up that we read, he's trying to, he's trying to bring Jonah out of the depths of his despair. He's trying to remind Jonah, hey, God, you, you can still trust me, Jonah. I'm still going to take care of you. In this particular case, Jonah was a danger to everyone around him. Because he wanted them all dead. <laughs> uh, we don't know what that would have led to had God allowed it to continue. Uh, so you see this attitude. Uh, Proverbs 29, 8 says, Scornful men bring a city into a snare. Yeah. Scornful men, that's attitude. James warns us of the dangers of this type of person. He says this in James 3, 14 through 16, But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. The wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. You see the terminology James throws out there? Your stinking attitude, it's not just, it's not just a, a, a problem that you're going through in life, it's wicked. So James says, we need to correct the attitude. Paul, Paul says the same thing to the church in Rome. He, he says this, he says, mark them and avoid them that cause divisions. Those problem makers, those troublemakers, uh, those ones that use their speech uh, to, to try to sway people, it says they have simple heart. Just avoid them. Get away from them. Uh, so we see an incorrigible attitude uh, was part of this intolerance. The second thing you see is an incarcerating attitude. This bad attitude of Jonah literally built for him a prison without bars. It kept him shackled uh, in, in his, in his uh, intolerance to these people and his disobedience to God. Uh, you see this in his life. Uh, uh, Jesus in John 8 said this, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant to sin. Jonah has become a slave now to his own bad attitude. Uh, he built the bars uh, of bad attitude that are keeping him now in this prison where he, he's not going to serve God. He's not going to glorify God. He's not going to make a difference. He's just going to sit and sulk. And he's done it to himself. Proverbs says, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. Isn't it amazing when you think about it how, how sin does that to you? It binds you. It beats you up. It wears you down. Uh, and, and when you get to that place where you're just con con continuing in that sin, uh, it gets you that, that attitude issue, and before long you're in that prison of sin, which God broke the chains of sin a long time ago for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. But sometimes we put ourselves back in that prison. Uh, Paul said to the church at Rome, uh, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The one I choose to serve is, is my master. Jonah had a choice to make here. Rejoice in God. Rejoice in God's blessings. Tell people about it. Get up and keep serving Him. Or, or, or be upset at the people God saved. And, and show my attitude and, and not live for God. We see, who, we see who Jonah's master was at this particular time. It was his bad attitude. You can play with sin. But eventually you're going to get burned. Playing with sin, I, I like to liken it to having a pet, uh, a pet baby python. As much as I hate snakes, this is a great example. You go to that pet store and you buy that little baby python. Oh, it's cute. It's going to grow up big and he's going to be my friend. And blah, yeah, 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 yeah. And every time that snake grows a little bit, it's just sizing you up. You know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> every time it grows, it's just, i got to get a little bit bigger before I can get this guy, right? And, and you raise that baby python. Uh, you think he's going to stay little. And before long, that baby python becomes a big python and can wrap itself around you and squish the life out of you. Right? And we toy with sin sometimes that way. Well, it's just a little sin. I'm, I'm not killing anybody, right? right? I'm not involved in some illicit affair. Right? You know, I'm not. That, that. You realize little sins very quickly become big sins. Yeah. Even all sins equal to God. And I'm talking in our eyes, right? Little sins very quickly start to grow and start to squeeze us and crush the life out of us. And, and we look for how, how do I get power to escape that? Well, it's got to be through Jesus Christ. Yeah. And we've got to we've got to repent of that and turn back to Him. Yeah. Jonah has this contentious intolerance. And it's immediately shown, and first of all, his attitude. His attitude is displayed here. The second thing I see about Joan here as we conclude the book here, I see a continuous independence. A continuous independence. When we were growing up, my, my mom <clears throat> used to make fun of my dad occasionally. 
And she would look at him, and instead of calling him by his name, she would look at him and go, S.S. And for years, I was like, what is, what, what is she, what, his name's Ken, what, what, honey, babe, whatever, what, S.S., what does that mean? I, I found out a little bit later what it meant, it meant self-sufficient. <laughs> because my dad didn't like to ask for help. I can do it. I don't need help, I can do it. And many times mom would look at him and say, self-sufficient, you don't know the difference between a screwdriver and a wrench, you need help. Yeah. SS. <laughs> now, they'll probably watch this video and they'll, they'll probably put hearts and likes and truth. This is true. I'm, I'm not making that up, all right? And, uh, and, and sometimes we get that way in our lives, don't we, as Christians? Everything's going okay. Uh, bills are paid, cars running, jobs going all right, wife and me are getting along, kids are doing okay, uh, health is good. And, and, and before long, we, we kind of put God off in this little box off to the, to the side and we become independent. Since the beginning of Jonah 1, what have we seen in Jonah? I don't need you, God. Matter of fact, you tell me to go here, I'm going the other way. Now, I, know, I know he prayed a little, you know, that little, wasn't heartfelt, but that little prayer, he prayed, get me out of the belly of the whale, you know. And he was independent. I'll do it on my own. I'll do what I think is best. By the way, how many times in the Bible do people get in trouble because they do what they think is best? Yeah. Oh, my Oh, the nation of Israel did it for years. They, everyone did that. was right in their own eyes, right? Think about how much trouble we get ourselves in when we think, I know more than God. I've got a better plan. I can do this, and, and here, here's, my, you know, here's my plan. Jonah's like this. I, I can do this. If you look at verse number four of our text that we read, it talks how Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And he made himself a little booth. I picture this little, little, uh, little table for it. Do you ever build table forts growing up? You know? Jonah's built him a little table fort out in the wilderness, right? Outside the city wall, he's got some sticks and maybe some rocks and uh, tree branches. He made this little place to sit. And he sits under it in the shadow. But the end of the verse says this. Till. He's going to sit here for a while. Till he might see what becomes of the city. He's sitting there for one reason. I'm waiting for God to rain down fire. <laughs> I'm waiting for God to get him. That's where he is. That's where he is. His selfish disobedience is seen in chapter 1. We started with that. And it's still seen in chapter 4 as we end with him. Uh, this is just Jonah's life, it seems like. Now, I know there were some foxhole prayers that he threw up in times of difficulty. We know that. Nothing's really changed in his life. He is still doing what he thinks is best. I thought it was best to go the opposite direction. I thought it was best to get on a ship. I thought it was best, you know, he's doing it again. I'm going to sit here because I know God's going to rain down fire because that's what he should do. And so he's sitting there waiting, his independence. I want to show you what this independence caused, okay? Because here's what we need to understand. When we become this, this way in our Christian lives and we think, man, I'm okay, I don't need God right now, everything's going well, I'm going to get... And so we get out of that rut of serving him and they get out of the habit of, of living through and all those different things. These same things are evident in our life. The first thing I see is this. It caused a lack of joy. It caused a lack of joy. You know one thing I found about revival? Revival always brings joy. Yeah. Revival always brings joy. You remember Philip in Acts chapter 8? Philip was preaching in Samaria, and, and revival took place. Evil spirits were cast out. Uh, lame people started walking in. People were healed. Uh, and just a, a great revival broke out in Samaria. In the end of Acts 8, verse number, or 8, Acts 8, verse 8, it talks about all that. And then it says this, uh, and many were, were lame were healed. It says, and there was great joy in that city. Why? Revival broke out. <laughs> revival brings joy. Now, I have no doubt in my mind, of course I wasn't there, I have no doubt in my mind, though, when Nineveh experienced this great revival, I got no doubt that the people were full of joy. There were moms and dads shouting hallelujah. Uh, families were, were, were rescued from sin. Uh, the nation, the city there had, had totally turned to God. You see this repentance breakout. I got a feeling there's a whole bunch of laughing and joy and excitement and praise going on. That's what revival produces. Jonah had just seen... Hundreds of thousands of people's burdens of sin lifted. He had just seen all these people saved from eternal judgment. And where is he? Sitting on a road on the east side of the wall, waiting and hoping for judgment to still fall. He's not happy. He's miserable. Jonah had a head knowledge of what was right. But he did not have a heart to do what he knew was right. Uh, 
joy in the Christian life does not come by what we know. Joy comes by what we do about what we know. Yeah, knowledge, 1 Corinthians 8 says, knowledge puffeth up. Joy is the result of what we do with the things we know to be true. Uh, John says, if ye you know these things, happy are ye if ye what? Do, do them. Do them. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves, James says. Uh, he, James also says, be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. This man shall be blessed in his deed. You, you see the difference? It's okay to know, but, but the joy comes when we do. And Jonah's missing this. Why? Because... God didn't do what I wanted. It's not fair the way he treated me versus the way he treated them. No joy. No joy. A lack of joy is almost always a result of a lack of obedience yeah. in some area of life. Sure. Almost always. A lack of joy is a lack of obedience. We see this in Jonah's life. This independence caused a lack of joy. Secondly, it caused a lingering jealousy. A lingering jealousy. Why is Jonah upset? Why, why, is he, why is he so mad about this? That he's willing to just say, kill me, God. Here's the thing. Jonah feels like God has treated the situation unfairly. You treated me one way, and you treated them differently. That is not fair, God. Look what you put me through. They get off scot-free. This is not fair. Can I, give you, can I give you a phrase to write down in your Bible and write on your mirror at home or write on your refrigerator or write in your car and say this phrase to yourself every morning you wake up? All right, you ready? You got your pens ready? Life is not fair. Get over it. Y'all get that? Can we say it again? Life is not fair. Get over it. Get over it. God does not have to be fair because he's just. Yeah. Amen. And sometimes when I look at things as being fair, God says that's not fair because if you really got what's fair, you don't want what's coming to you, son. Right? Jonah is jealous because he feels like Nineveh got off scot-free just because they repented. Well, they repented. Try it, Jonah. <laughs> right? <laughs> they repented. And so God forgave them. Proverbs says this about jealousy in chapter 6. Jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom. Neither will, his rest con uh, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Isn't it amazing how jealous we can be? Uh, like, like Jonah here, God has given us so much, but because somebody else got one thing more. Oh, God! Right? Why did they get blessed with that? I've been, I've been teaching Sunday school longer than they have. My Christian walk, I know, is much better than theirs. Why didn't I? Am I right? And this jealousy starts to show, and the reality is this, we ought to rejoice when somebody's blessed by God. Rejoice with them. Solomon, very wise, said this in chapter 8. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. It's amazing how, how devastating the, the sin of jealousy can be in our lives. Yeah. Jonah has no joy. He's showing this lingering jealousy, all because Jonah wants it his way, yeah. his independent attitude. I, I, see, I see another thing here, number three. Let her see. I see a looking for judgment. A looking for judgment. This independence of Jonah as he's sitting there waiting to see what might become of the city. He's lost his joy. He's jealous about something that really there's no business to be jealous about because God did what God should have done, right? <laughs> and if Jonah wanted God to be fair, Jonah probably wouldn't have been around to preach this revival, all right? And now you see him still just sitting there looking, God, are you going to get him? God, are you going to get him? Come on, God, it's time to get him. Get him, God, get him, God, get him, God. You remember Isaiah? Isaiah had a moment in Scripture in, in the first uh, couple of few chapters, about six chapters in. Remember Isaiah? Let's get him, God. Let's get him, God. Let's get him, God. And God said, hang on a minute. Yeah. Before you write 60 chapters getting them, you need to get yourself right first, right? Yeah. right. Jonah failed to deal with himself, yet he's so worried about God judging somebody else. Well, I, I, hate, I hate to be honest tonight and step on my toes, but how many times is that me and you? I'm not looking forward to God's judgment in my life. I mean, come on, God. You know, you forgive me, and I'm your favorite, right? Yeah. <laughs> but 
did you see what they did this week? Yeah. When are you going to get them, God? That's Jonah. He's looking for judgment. He's waiting for God's judgment to fall on Nineveh. He's experienced the personal mercy of God already in his life multiple times, yet he's not willing to allow that same mercy of God to be extended to the people of Nineveh, and he can't believe God spared that city. When God's word is obeyed, here's what we find out. God has a track record of forgiveness. God has never said, sorry, won't forgive you. Sorry, can't do it. When God forgives, there's no lingering cloud of judgment. Uh, the Bible talks about how our, 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 our sins are made as, as white as snow. Uh, Psalm says they're removed as far as the east is from the west. That's how far our transgressions are removed. Uh, Isaiah says, He blotteth out thy transgressions for his own sake and will not remember our sins. That's our God. Yet Jonah is sitting there saying, Come on, God. You remember what they did. Listen, when God offers forgiveness, God doesn't say, Oh, yeah, but let me... Let me keep a tally here. Let me keep that in my record sheet so that if you do it again, I can refer you back to it. No, they're blotted out. Jonah's not willing to allow that. Because he wants God to do what he thinks God should do. A continuous independence. That leads me to the last thought tonight. Number three. I see a covetous ingratitude. A covetous ingratitude. Of course, covetous jealousy, they go hand in hand, really. A covetous ingratitude. God, as Jonah's sitting out there beside the wall, whining and crying and boo hoo he bow baby. And, you, you, you just kill me, God. It's not fair. God says, you know what? I want to take some of his grief. Now, again, I say this a lot. I'm glad I wasn't God. I'm glad I'm not God, okay? Because I would have just said, look, dude, you're dead. Gone. Wipe you up. I'm finished with you. Cry, baby. Right? God says, you know what? I want to take some of that despair away. And so God prepares a gourd to grow very quickly to come up over the head of Jonah and provide him with shade and protection. Right? Jonah doesn't say thank you. Jonah doesn't say, Phew, Lord, thank you so much for helping me with that. Well, that's a blessing. He just sits and enjoys the shade that God provides for him. That morning, when the morning breaks, he sends a worm that kills that gourd and it dies, and then he sends that... What, that, wet, that eastern wind in and the sun starts beating down upon Jonah and he starts to faint and says once again just kill me God I don't, it's not worth living right and God says do us not well to be angry you didn't plant the gourd you didn't water the gourd you didn't buy the seed to put in the ground you didn't cultivate it you didn't weed it what are you mad about because it died you didn't even thank me for it in the first place it's ingratitude Look at, look at a couple of thoughts here I put down uh, about this ingratitude. You see, a misunderstood condolence. A misunderstood condolence. This gourd was not provided by Jonah just simply to alleviate some of his despair. I believe with all my heart this gourd was a picture. I believe it was a picture of God's mercy that he was showing to Nineveh. Yeah, exactly. He was trying to show jo Jonah something. Uh, he was trying to show Jonah, uh, unlike the people of Nineveh, Jonah... Was, uh, was glad for the gourd, but he didn't realize it was a gift from God. The, 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 the forgiveness that Nineveh was experiencing was the gift from God because they turned to him. He's showing Jonah this through the score. He says, I provided this for you. And Jonah doesn't even recognize it as a gift from God. He was glad for the gourd, but he wasn't grateful to God for the gourd. God is the one who provided it. Jonah probably felt like, well, God, you deserve, I mean, you, 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 I deserve this gourd. You know, you should give me this. You should, you should give me this protection. You know, in reality, God does not have to do anything for us. Not one single thing does God have to do for us. I don't deserve his grace. I don't deserve his mercy. I don't deserve his love. But he's more than glad to give it to those that are grateful for that gift, isn't he? Uh, you know, think about this. Uh, God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. Uh, the, the Lord be high, he hath respect unto the lowly. We saw that verse in Psalms this morning. Uh, God takes care of us, does he not? Yes, but sometimes I fail to, 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 to give the proper condolences to him, don't I? Yeah. And, and that life of ingratitude we see in Jonah's life, this is, this is the last thing we're reading about Jonah now, is his, his, his attitude of ingratitude. Yeah, I'm not even going to thank God for the blessing of the gourd. The second thing you see is a missing characteristic. A missing characteristic. I'm not going to have you do it right now because of time. 
you know, it takes some of you a lot longer than others. But go back, okay, if, if you feel like it, okay, if you, feel that if, you, if you got the unction, all right, go back and read all four chapters of Jonah again. And if you can find one time in the book of Jonah where he was thankful, I'd be happy to give you a lot of money. <laughs> Go ahead, reread it. Read all four chapters. See if you can find where Jonah was thankful. He wasn't thankful for God's will for his life. God had a plan for Jonah. He wasn't thankful for that. He wasn't thankful that God chastened him when he disobeyed to get him on the proper path. We ought to be thankful for the chastening of God. Amen. First of all, it shows where his child was. Secondly, it's him correcting us, getting us on path. He was not thankful for the chastisement. He was not thankful when God said, I'll give you a second chance to serve me. He was not thankful for the, the revival that just broke out in Nineveh. He was not thankful for the relief from the heat provided uh, by the gourd here in chapter 5. Let, let me just say this. If we don't have a gratitude attitude, we simply have an attitude. Our, our attitude as Christians ought to constantly be an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of thankfulness, an attitude of praise to our God, an attitude of realizing that everything I have, everything I am, everything I will be, everything that will happen in my life is directly uh, a, a, a product of God working in my life. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Him. Uh, this attitude needs to be an attitude of thankfulness, this gratitude. Uh, I, I want to I take your attention to something for just a minute. You don't, you don't have to turn there, but if you're familiar with Romans chapter 1, how many of you are familiar with Romans chapter 1? Uh, a handful of you? Romans chapter 1 lists some very despicable sins yes. in verses 20, uh, about 26 through 31. I mean, it just gives a list of nasty, horrendous, oh, wow, I don't want to be caught doing these things. They're terrible, right? Mm -hmm. After a list of sin takes place, uh, verse 32 says this, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So it lists these despicable sins. And in verse 32 uh, in Romans, it says this, they enjoy doing them. They don't just do them knowing God's going to judge. They do them and they flaunt it. They do it and they're happy about it. They do it and they enjoy it. A very sad state of affairs. Sin is committed... And the consequences of their sin is laughed to scorn. God judges sin, period. Yeah. But these people are saying, we know that. We're just going to do it anyway. We're going to laugh about it. We're going to have fun with it. How does something like that start in someone's life? How does somebody become that low in their life that they're willing to commit some, some atrocious sins and then say, I don't care? How does, that, how does it happen? Where does it all start? Well, guess what? If you read Romans chapter 1, it gives us the condition of how it all starts. And in verse number 21, here's what it says. This is the genesis or the starting of this reprobate lifestyle that leads to committing sins, knowing they're filthy, knowing God's going to judge and laughing about it. Here's the start, Romans 1, 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. That ought to shake some people up. That, that, ought, that ought to stir our hearts a little bit tonight. Because the reality is this. When I can live my life without being thankful and, and, and grateful and praising God for His goodness, when I can come to a point in my Christian life that I can live my life that way, I'm on a very slippery slope in the downward direction. Because my life ought to always be filled with praise. That ought to be constantly on the forefront of my mind and on the tip of my tongue to, to offer praise to God and thank Him for all He does. They were not thankful. You know God tonight, I'm sure. Hopefully He's the God of your life, but sometimes we find ourselves in Jonah's boat, no pun intended. And, and we try to be our own God. We try to do our own thing. The next step after a disobedient spirit is an ungrateful spirit. And the rest, as they say in Romans chapter 1, is history. It starts with disobedience, shown in my attitude, uh, that, ungra that ungratefulness sets in, and I, I'm not thankful, and then that slope just continues downward until I'm doing some things I never wish I would have done, never thought I would have done. That's Jonah. The last thing I see is this, as we end this, uh, this thought of ingratitude, I see a merciful climax. The ending... In God's eyes, at least, the ending in God's perspective is awesome. Jonah still struggles with it. 
the Lord says to Jonah, you know, you didn't grow the gourd, you didn't work on the gourd, yet you want to complain about the gourd dying? Is that right? Yes, right, yeah, I should. And he reminds Jonah in the ending verse here, he says this, there are um, six score thousand persons that cannot even discern their left hand from the right. Now, I'm not real smart, okay? But I did a little bit of math. Six score thousand people, okay? That's 120,000 people that didn't know their left hand from their right. So that means one of two things. Or one of three things. They were either children young enough not to know their left from the right. They had mental problems where they did not know their left from the right. Or they were just adults like Noah who didn't know their left from the right. <laughs> Sorry. I just keep picking on Noah. It's nice. so simple. It's, it's just easy. He makes it, he makes it fun for me. Thanks, Noah. <laughs> anyway, I'm kidding. All right? Most of, most of folks, you know, you learn your left from your right at a very young age. So God is saying to Jonah, there's 120,000 that don't even know their left from the right. And you really want me to destroy the city? Because you think that's fair? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to show mercy. And I'm going to show grace. And he closes the story, God does, with a reminder of his mercy. Jonah's opinion was, they deserve to be destroyed. Maybe that's our thought of Nineveh as well. You know, they should have been destroyed. Nineveh didn't deserve God's mercy. But the truth is this. Neither do we. Neither do we. Titus says this. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Lamentation says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Okay. Think about that this evening. The end of our story, the end of Jonah's story, always ends with the mercy of God. Amen. Because he's a merciful God. Amen. And Jonah would have done so much better had he realized that. And had he accepted what God had done, had he praised God for it, we might, we might know what happened to Jonah. <laughs> we, might, we might know more about Jonah. Had his attitude not been so bad throughout this entire book and at the end. I'm thankful for the merciful ending that God always provides in our lives. Because that's who he is and that's what he is. There's a song in our, in our hymn book. I don't know if we sing it as a congregation or not. Uh, Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on, Mount, on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. That's our God. That's the God we talked about this morning. That's the God that we serve. That's Jonah's God. But Jonah seemed to have a problem with realizing it. And I just want to challenge this, Christian. Again, we spent a lot of time going through the book of Jonah, just those four little chapters. Um, let's learn from Jonah. I mean, we, we tend to focus on just the, you know, the, the story of the whale and all that, thing, all the extras and all that. We learned a lot about Jonah through, this, through, this, through these lessons here. Let, let's make sure we apply those truths. Amen. And be doers of the word. Amen. Amen. And, and let's learn from Jonah. Let's be obedient, knowing that obedience brings blessings. Amen. Let's have a grateful attitude. How important is that? We see that in the end of the book yes. here. Uh, let's be obedient. Let's be grateful. And let God take care of the rest. And his mercy and his grace and his love in our lives are wonderful things that we get to experience often. Next week, we're going to start something uh, brand new. I put that up there before I knew what I was going to do, and I added the next one. But uh, we're going to look at some transforming truths from Scripture. And we're going to go through a dozen or so just uh, uh, Scripture verses that we most of them we know well. But we want to look at how when we grasp those, those Scripture references, how it totally transforms us. Uh, you've seen that. You've seen the. You ever seen one of the really ugly caterpillars? Some of them are like terrifying. I don't even want to look at it. Oh, scary, right? But when that thing makes its cocoon, and then that thing opens up later, what comes out? Gorgeous butterflies. Some of the be most beautiful butterflies come from the ugliest caterpillars. Sure. You know, same thing's true with Christianity. Same thing's true with our life. God has a way of transforming us through His Word, if we'll just let Him. So I want to look at that for a few weeks uh, going, going forward here and look at some very, again, some of them are very well-known scriptures. Uh, but we want to teach through some of these scriptures that teach us how to allow God just to transform us into what he wants us to be, not what I think I should be. 
Because he had a totally different plan, amen? We see that Jonah's life as well. So that's where we'll be over the next couple, uh, next couple of months, I guess you could say. So uh, any questions tonight, comments, thoughts? We've got the blanks filled in. All good to go. Don't go to McDonald's after church. Their shake machine is down. It's always down. It usually is, I know. But I went to McDonald's for shakes today, and I called, called Noah back, and I said, like usual, the shake machine is out. So what else do you want? But anyways. All right. Got everything covered? I was grateful that there was sweet tea at least. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's pray then, and we'll be dismissed tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you do, God. And God, I pray that you'll help us, Lord. We spent a lot of time studying through the book of Jonah. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will help us to apply some of these truths that we've learned uh, to our lives and to our relationship with you, Lord. May we always strive for obedience. Lord, I know there are going to be times where we fail, we let you down, uh, and we sin, Lord. I pray that you help us to seek forgiveness very quickly. Help us to get our hearts right with you very quickly. And, Lord, may we just enjoy the mercy and the grace of God in our lives. May we be constantly thankful for it. May we never cease to praise you, Lord, for uh, the mercies that you provide for us every day. And, Lord, may we draw closer to you because of how good you are to us, I pray. Uh, Father, we ask you now as we uh, dismiss this evening, uh, just give us safety to travel to our homes, please. Uh, bring us back again on Wednesday. And we pray that you'll be with the few folks that we mentioned at the beginning of our service, Lord, that are down sick. And uh, we think of Miss Mary tonight. We pray that you'll touch her very quickly, get her feeling better. And, of course, Mona, or Norma, she's traveling. Uh, Charlie's back surgery coming up, and even Ben as he's recovering. Uh, Lord, so many things that are going on in our church family's lives. We pray that you'll be uh, close to each one of them through these things, we pray. And may they lean on you for strength that's needed during their times of, of, of trial or uh, problems, Lord, we pray. Uh, Father, again, we just thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for what you continue to do. May we live for you this week. And may we make a difference for, for Christ here on this earth. And we tell people about you this week and lift you up and magnify you uh, through praise and worship, we pray. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a couple hands on your way out. We'll see you when I have a praise. Uh, Detroit has a praise. My financial is a problem with my medical has been taken care of by the Lord. Thank you very Amen. much. Amen. 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 How many had Troy on your on your list Wednesday night? Was your several of us in here? All right. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for telling us. Remind us again on Wednesday so that we can oh. report it and everything. Just really okay. So thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. That's a good way to end the service. Get out of here now. Amen.